So with Guardians of the Galaxy coming out in the next few days, Benny and I have come up with this idea to effectively split Ron and the Accuser in half in order to have this sort of Marvel crossover event. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the history, the origins, so to speak, of Ron and the Accuser here on my channel. And we're going to discuss the origins of the Kree Empire, how it was the Kree Empire advanced itself, as well as the motives and the basis behind the being the supreme intelligence. From there, we'll transition over to Benny's channel and we'll get into a discussion about the Annihilation storyline, about Ron and the Accuser during the events after the formation of the Guardians of the Galaxy, and his role regarding the big picture when it comes to the universe as a whole and his place in the Kree Empire. But in order to understand the entire backstory behind Ron and the Accuser, in order to understand why it is that he does what he does, we need to go back to the origins of the Kree. We need to jump back to when the Kree first rose to prominence in the Empire, as well as the earliest formations and what would eventually turn into the Supreme Intelligence. So the origins of the Kree are first given to us in Captain Marvel Volume 1, Issue Number 38. And what we learn here is that in the infancy of the Kree Empire, that they share their planet with another race called the Kotati. And while the Kree were very humanoid in terms of their physical appearance, with the exception of the fact that they had blue skin, uh, what we saw was that the Kotati were very plant-like in their appearance. That in fact, the Kotati, for the most part, could best be compared to Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, with the exception of the fact that where Groot looks more like a tree in terms of his physical appearance, that the Kotati are very lush and very green and resemble more along the order of plants or bushes. But what we see is that the Scroll Empire, which was very fledgling at the time, it was expanding and it was growing, was seeking to add various races to itself to uh, help it expand into the world of trade and commerce. And that the Scrolls had come across the home planet Hala of the Kree and the, uh, the Kotati. And what they did is, while they were interested in giving one of these races a uh, chance to join the Empire, they gave them a test, more or less. And what they did is they took both races to the moon of the planet Earth, and they gave them a year's worth of supplies, and they gave them the opportunity to effectively use those supplies to build whatever they would need to make themselves self-sufficient. Self and after a year's time, the scrolls returned, and the scrolls found that the Kotati had built this very lush environment. They had built this very welcoming sort of environment and that the Kree had used their uh, technology to build a very uh, beautiful and a very, um, I guess, advanced kind of uh, castle or fortress, so to speak. Due to the fact that the scrolls at the time were a peaceful race, they allied themselves with the Kotati and chose to induct the Kotati into their empire. In response to this, the Kree killed all of almost all of the Kotati on the moon, as well as the uh, the scroll delegation which had arrived to pass judgment on the two races. From there, the Kree had reverse engineered the technology of the scrolls and began to advance themselves at a very va very rapid rate. Now, in Avengers Volume Three, Issue Number Thirty Five, the story story continues, although it takes place several thousand years, or possibly even more, after the original uh, incident involving the, the, the Kree and the Kotati. And what we learn is that somewhere along the line, the Kree began to run into evolutionary stagnation, meaning that they were not uh, evolving anymore. And so, in response to this, the Supreme Intelligence launched this sort of, um, I guess, war, or launched this sort of conflict with the Shi'ar between the Kree and the Shi'ar itself. And and the Shi'ar Empire, in turn, detonated something called the Negabomb, and this was entirely motivated by the Supreme Intelligence. The Supreme Intelligence had rationalized that if the Negabomb, or if some kind of conflict, came along that virtually rendered the entire uh, Kree race almost to the point of non-existence, that uh, they would begin to uh, evolve again. Their evolutionary process would be jump-started. This was also further enhanced by the Supreme Intelligence when it used something called the Forever Crystal. But what we saw is that where previously the Kree had begun to evolve or had evolved with uh, involving humanoids with blue skin, that a new version of the Kree called the Rule began to evolve. And this is where we run into the hierarchical differences between the Kree in terms of their own society. That the Kree have this inherent, this original society, those individuals that could trace their lineage back to the original Kree who had blue skin. 
those individuals are considered part of the aristocratic society, meaning that they are part of the inner circle. They are the only ones that are really allowed to uh, hold the higher positions that are available in the Cree Empire. Everybody else who is able to trace their lineage back to a rule is viewed as being lesser than that. They are simply just common citizens. And from here, we get into this discussion where we talk about the supreme intelligence, where we talk about what it is that supreme intelligence does and the entire basis behind the supreme intelligence. So when the Kree Supreme Intelligence first appeared in the Marvel Universe is a date that we really can't put our fingers on, or at least to the best of my research, it's not a date that we could specifically point to. But all we really know is that somewhere along the line, the Kree began to use their uh, technology to connect or to uh, form a hive mind out of the greatest minds to have ever existed in the Kree Empire. And that as the eons passed, that more and more minds were added to this uh, Supreme Intelligence hive mind. Mind. And this is the entire basis behind the Supreme Intelligence. The Supreme Intelligence is an amalgamation of all the greatest minds who have ever existed in the Kree Empire. And that as the years go on, and that as various uh, individuals who are great in their own right begin to rise up, that when their time comes when they die, that their mind will be added to the Supreme Intelligence, and the Supreme Intelligence will maintain this role of being the spiritual and political leader of the Kree Empire. Now, just because the Supreme Intelligence is an amalgamation of the greatest minds doesn't mean that it cannot go awry. But over the course of Marvel Comics, in terms of the publication histories and the Supreme Intelligence, we don't really see this happening very often. For the most part, the Supreme Intelligence exists to one, ensure its own survival, and two, to ensure the survival of the Kree Empire. And in one of the most, most notable events, if you recall our discussion about the Inhumans, we had talked about how the Inhumans were designed by the Kree to effectively be soldiers, to take on various forms once they had undergone terrogenesis, and their forms would be used to infiltrate uh, various races. And of course, this is something that we will touch on later again in this video as we continue our discussion on Ron and the Accuser and his role regarding the Inhumans. But what we had learned is that in the origins, in the uh, initial creation of the Metagenesis Project, which was the project that led to the creation of the Inhumans, that one of the minds of the Supreme Intelligence had determined that there would be dissent, that at some point along the line, one of these projects would begin to rise up against the Kree Empire, and that it would result in the destruction of the Supreme Intelligence. But the problem here is that the Supreme Intelligence was only able to calculate this to a 90, percent, uh, 90 percentile, and so as a result all but 10% of the Metagenesis Project was destroyed. And of this 10%, this included the Inhumans of the planet Earth. And again, this is simply just the uh, the Supreme Intelligence carrying out its design to ensure that it survives along with the Kree Empire, even if that means destroying the projects that the Kree Empire had formed over the years. Now from here, we begin to transition into the Fantastic Four, and we begin to get into seeing the Kree Empire, seeing the Supreme Intelligence, and seeing Ron and the Accuser appear. And one of the things that we'll learn here is that Ron and the Accuser isn't necessarily a bad guy. That Ron and the Accuser's role as the Accuser or the head of the Accuser Corps, which is the law enforcement agency of the Kree Empire and is designed to carry out the will of the Supreme Intelligence, that Ron and the Accuser is in fact doing just that. That he is a perfect example of this argument of a person who is in effect just following orders. So the Supreme Intelligence and Ron and the Accuser first appear in Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 65. But in order to make this comic make sense, we actually need to touch on the previous comic on issue number 64, because the events in that comic will directly lead into the events of issue number 65 and give us the understanding of why it is that Ron and the Accuser and why it is that the Supreme Intelligence have both been given to us and why Ron and the Accuser is traveling to the planet Earth. So with Fantastic Four issue number 64, what we see going on here is that Reed Richards and uh, Ben Grimm have been working tirelessly over the course of spring to ensure that uh, various technologies and that various defense systems are up to snuff in the Baxter building. But Susan Storm is a little irritated by this due to the fact that it is spring and Susan Storm wants to take a vacation. Reed Richards is a little hesitant about this because he rationalizes that uh, there will always be threats and that the Baxter building needs to be at the highest level of 
operation in order to ensure that threats both to the Baxter Building and the Fantastic Four themselves, as well as the Earth as a whole, can be uh, staved off, or they can at the very least be held off to ensure that uh, no harm really comes to anybody. But Susan Storm begins to argue with uh, Reed Richards, and again, this touches on the hallmark of the Fantastic Four, in the sense that the Fantastic Four uh, were the first superhero team to really argue and to really give us an idea of, or I guess a reflection of what family life is like in Marvel Comics, and again, is a reflection of real life family life. But what we see going on is that Reed Richards, Ben Grimm, and Johnny Storm acquiesce to Susan Storm, and they agree to, uh, to go on a vacation of sorts. What we also see going on here is that on a remote island somewhere off the coast of the Atlantic, I think, um, that... A uh, archaeologist and a hired gun, who of course has been hired to ensure this archaeologist's safety, are exploring this island. And the whole reason for this is because this archaeologist had come across evidence to show that extraterrestrials had visited the planet Earth in the past. Now, this archaeologist doesn't know about the Inhumans, and he doesn't know that this extraterrestrial race was the Kree. But his explorations have led him to this island, to some sort of temple or safe place or whatever the case may be, uh, to give him a chance to investigate and give him a chance to explore. But what we see is that when this area is activated, that he unwillingly or unwittingly activates the sentry. And the sentry is one of the Kree sentries that had been stationed on the planet Earth. And if you recall our discussion about the Inhumans, we had talked about how, uh, I guess, after the Kree had left the planet Earth, they had left behind various sentries. And these sentries were designed to uh, execute a number of, uh, of programs that had been installed in them. Some of the sentries were designed to monitor the Kree, to, or I'm sorry, the Inhumans, and to report back to the Kree the progress of the Inhumans. And others were given different tasks. And this Kree in particular, Kree number 459, was actually given the task of safeguarding this island to ensure that nobody trespassed. But because of the fact that this archaeologist and the hired gun have trespassed, that this uh, Kree sentry immediately imprisons them. From here, we transition back to the Fantastic Four. And the Fantastic Four are again enjoying their uh, vacation. They have arrived on the island. But almost immediately after arriving, they encounter this uh, Kree sentry, and the Kree sentry again attempts to ensnare them, attempts to trap them for trespassing on the island. The Fantastic Four respond in kind in a manner of self-defense and begin to attack the Kree sentry. And over the course of this combat, what we see is that eventually the sentry is destroyed. As a result of this, we pick up with Fantastic Four issue number 65, and what we see is that the Supreme Intelligence sends the Fantastic Four a dream, and tells the Fantastic Four that uh, they have to await the arrival of Ron and the Accuser to stand for their crimes to, of destroying the Sentry, which is viewed as an affront to the Kree Empire. From here, we see that Ron and the Accuser is traveling to the planet Earth, and Ron and the Accuser is talking about how during the Great Purge that we had previously talked about during the uh, discussion on the Supreme Intelligence, where by 90% of the entire Metagenesis project was destroyed, that the Earth had been forgotten, and that no one had really thought about the Earth up until these events, and that the destruction of the Kree Century raises two main points. The first is that it's possible that the Metagenesis project has allowed the humans who were experimented on to progress to such a degree that they can now be used as soldiers in the Kree army. But the other half of this is that perhaps the Metagenesis project did not work, but there are still superhumans on the planet earth and those superhumans can be used but the first and foremost role of ron and the accuser in his arrival on the planet earth is to carry out the will to carry out the judgment of the supreme intelligence that the uh, Fantastic Four have been found guilty of, in effect, affronting the Kree Empire. We see that when Ron and the Accuser arrives, that of course he confronts the Fantastic Four, and his first act is to change the Fantastic Four's clothing from their street clothes to their uniforms. And this is done using his universal weapon. And the universal weapon is, of course, the weapon that is designed specifically for the head accuser, or the top of uh, the top of accuser, which uh, Ron and the Accuser currently uh, resides in. And that the universal weapon has a multitude of effects. The most common form that Ron and the Accuser uses it for is either flight, force fields, or energy projection, but the universal weapon can also be used for matter manipulation. Now, this isn't matter manipulation on the scale of Franklin Richards. It's actually much, much smaller, but it's still very formidable in its own right and allows Ron and the Accuser to become one of the more formidable people in the Marvel Universe in terms of his fighting prowess and the abilities that he possesses. In addition, 
we see that Ron and the Accuser does this simply to demonstrate the fact that he uh, he has, uh, or he views himself as being uh, over the Fantastic Four, that he has designed, he has done this to simply establish his supremacy, so to speak. And we begin to see that the Fantastic Four and Ron and the Accuser begin to fight one another. Now, what Ron and the Accuser had also done here is he had also, in effect, created a force field around this island. And the whole reason for that was to ensure that no external forces could interfere with the judgment that's being presided over the Fantastic Four. As the conflict progresses, we see that the Fantastic Four are, for the most part, uh, able to hold their own against Ron and the Accuser, but Ron and the Accuser is also able to hold his own, uh, own as well, which is actually quite impressive considering that it's the full might of the Fantastic Four versus one man. But ultimately, we see that uh, Ben Grimm is able to take Ron and the Accuser's uh, actions, his attempt at passing judgment on the Fantastic Four, and turn it on Ron and the Accuser. Now, all this really means is that Ron and the Accuser appears to have been prepared to deal the, to deal the uh, killing blow. Now, we don't know if it would have actually killed the Fantastic Four. We assume that it will, since that's usually the role that Ron and the Accuser plays. But for the most part, he is, in fact, defeated by the Fantastic for. But what we see is that Ron and the Accuser simply just disappears. We don't really know where he went to, but we're for the most part left to presume that Ron and the Accuser had traveled back to uh, the Supreme Intelligence to inform him not only of his failure to implement his judgment or the judgment of the, uh, the Supreme Intelligence on the Fantastic Four, but that the Fantastic Four themselves are quite formidable of an enemy and that the planet Earth may also inhabit other superheroes who are equally formidable or even more so. So after Ron and the Accuser's appearance in the Fantastic Four issue number 65 in volume 1, we see that for the most part Ron and the Accuser will now be relegated to the role of appearing periodically in Captain Marvel stories, as well as Silver Surfer and other stories that take place on a galactic scale. He'll appear periodically in the Avengers, but for the most part most of his experiences or most of his appearances will take place in Captain Marvel. And this makes sense because Marvel is in effect a Kree, and his initial place, his initial idea was to simply try travel to the planet Earth as a spy for the Kree after the results of uh, of the Fantastic Four defeating Ron and the Accuser, but that he would actually turn against the Kree Empire and join the superhero community on the planet Earth. And what we see for the most part is that when Ron and the Accuser appears in uh, Captain Marvel's comics, that his goal is, into, is to effect, uh, implement justice on Captain Marvel to attempt to capture him and... Um, the attempt to force him to stay in punishment for his actions of betraying the Kree Empire. Most are, more often than not, he's not successful. In fact, uh, Captain Marvel seems to get away every single time, but at the very least, it's simply just a chance for us to see more of Ron and the Accuser. And for the most part, we see Ron and the Accuser playing roles that are very similar to the same role that he played during the Fantastic Four, where he demonstrates in the beginning of the conflict his power and his ability to implement justice on uh, on behalf of the Kree Empire and the power that he wields using the Universal Weapon. But we also see that Ron and the Accuser, even without the Universal Weapon, is quite formidable in terms of his abilities and in terms of what it is that he's capable of doing. That uh, without the Universal Weapon, he is still a very uh, capable hand-to-hand -hand combatant, that he is a very capable leader, and he is very capable in being able to rally troops together for a particular cause. One of the more notable storylines involving Ron and the Accuser after the events of Fantastic Four issue number 65 comes during Inhumans Volume 3, and for the most part, this is a four-part series. It's actually a very limited run, and what we see here is that Ron and the Accuser returns to uh, planet Earth to capture the Inhumans from Attilan, and the whole basis for this is Ron and the Accuser is, in effect, trying to force the Inhumans to fulfill the role to which they were initially designed, that the Inhumans, when they were created, were designed to uh, infiltrate other races, which is the reason why the Inhumans take on various forms when they undergo terogenesis, and that Ron and the Accuser has, in effect, kidnapped the Inhumans and is trying to put them in a position where they will be subservient to him. Now, over the course of this four-part limited series, we, of course, see that uh, Black Bolt challenges Ron and the Accuser to combat, and that if Ron and the Accuser is successful, then the Inhumans will acquiesce and the Inhumans will serve the Kree Empire, but that if Black Bolt is successful, that the Inhumans will be allowed to go free. Of course, over the course of this conflict, we see that uh, Black Bolt appears to be losing, but at the end of the 
the story, we see that he is successful in defeating Ron and the Accuser, and the Inhumans are allowed to go about their way. From here, we're going to transition over to Benny's channel, and we're going to talk about Ron and the Accuser after the events of the Inhumans Volume 1, or Volume 3 rather, and we're going to be talking about Ron and the Accuser during and after the events of Annihilation, following into Annihilation Conquest, The War of Kings, as well as Infinity.